Income tax 2021-2022 software example depreciation of rental property. Get ready to get refunds to the max diving into income tax 2021-2022. LACERT tax software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but you might want to have access to the forms and schedules, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Starting point here, we got the single filer, Adam Smith, living in Beverly Hills, 90210. Adam has some rental income flowing through to line number eight. Let's take a look at that flow through process. We got the Schedule E, which is the supplemental income and loss. This is going to be the property that is rental property in this instance. Then down below, we basically have an income statement, which we've kept quite simple at this point with the rents, and that being the income, of course, for the rental property at the 120000 and then one expense at the 20000 That nets out to that net amount of the 100000 which flows into the Schedule 1 called the Additional Income and Adjustments to Income at the 100000 That then flows in to page 1 of the Form 1040, the place we started at, the 8 line number 8, you recall? It wasn't that long ago. You probably remember. So this is going to be the total income, 100000 We got the standard deduction at the 12550 We've got the taxable income at the 87450 Page number two, calculating the tax at the 15015 Let's go back to page one. Let's go to Schedule E, and we're going to add a bit of complication. That's going to be with the depreciable type of assets. Now, there's different types of depreciable assets that we could put on the book. The general idea is the same. That being, if something is a large kind of expenditure, it's going to be benefiting multiple periods into the future, then we shouldn't be putting it on the books as simply an expense here, even if we paid cash for it, even if we're on a cash basis system for other kinds of transactions. This one's such a large deviation from a cash basis or from the time that we make the payment to the benefit that that uh, expenditure is going to be providing us that the tax code forces us to use an accrual concept that being a concept of depreciation putting the asset on the books as an asset and then depreciating it now you'll note that we don't have a balance sheet on this schedule e this is just an income statement so how do i put it on the books as an asset well we're not going to have a balance sheet but we'll have another schedule which will be a depreciation schedule which will at least have that one asset and the detail behind it for the depreciation uh, of it so that's where we're going to put it that's going to be the balance sheet account then we'll pull it over here uh, in terms of depreciation. Now, what kind of things do we need to depreciate? Well, first of all, obviously the property itself. So even if we paid cash for the property, which isn't often the case, we often finance the property, but even if we were to have paid cash for the property, we, we're not gonna just expense the property because that's the biggest example of something that is the, is the reason you have an accrual concept of putting it on the books as an asset. It would be a huge distortion to say, I'm gonna put the property on the first year of rental as an expense, like a $300,000 rental property down here, and I'll just expense the whole thing, doesn't, doesn't really uh, make sense because that rental property is going to be generating revenue for many periods into the future. So from an accrual concept, it would make more sense for us to take that cost and allocate it over the useful life or over the period that that, that expenditure is going to be benefiting. And that's going to be the, the general concept. So we'll do it with the actual property itself and then any large kind of improvements that we'd have to be putting on the books, we'd have to put those on the books uh, as, as improvements as opposed to say simply repairs. And that's oft, always gonna be kind of a, a confusing component uh, to think about is something a repair or is it an improvement? And remember our mindset is always trying to say, I would like to record it as an expense as opposed to capitalizing it. That's the typical mindset of the taxpayer meaning my mindset as a taxpayer is I'd like to get the expense earlier rather than later. So if I can expense it today instead of capitalizing it, then that's what I would typically like to do. And if I have to capitalize it, then I would like a shorter lifespan and an accelerated depreciation method as opposed to a longer lifespan that I have to depreciate it over and uh, a, a non-accelerated, like a straight line depreciation method. So that's kind of our mindset from a taxpayer perspective to maximize our, our, tax, uh, our tax situation. Now note, when you're talking about other types of things that you might have to put on there like refrigerators or, or appliances and this kind of stuff, 
You could also have accelerated depreciation that could be on the books like a 179 depreciation and, and like special depreciation, which could allow you to depreciate more upfront, basically expensing it in essence, even though you have to go through a depreciation process. And that's going to be dependent on the tax code. There's very extreme policies to allow accelerated depreciation in an attempt to stimulate the economy, which obviously <laughs> they stimulated the economy far past you know, it's overheating right now in economic terms. So you would think that they might roll back those policies, even though it's not popular to do that. But so we will see what happens with those accelerated methods. But you got to take into consider 179 deduction and special depreciation as well. So let's put the building on the books for, for first of all. Now, the, the actual property itself, if we bought it for rental property, it would be pretty straightforward. We would just put it on the books as 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 the rental property although it's still kind of complex because we have to add up all the stuff that's involved but if it was personal property before that like your personal residence and converted to rental property it, it gets a little bit more confusing because now you got to think about the, the cost that you had versus the fair market value of it so just keep that into consideration and <clears throat> we need to be breaking out between the amount we paid for land and the amount that we're, we paid for the building because the land is not depreciable and the building is depreciable. So again, we would, from our standpoint, we would typically like to put the, the, this more into the building than into the land because we would like to depreciate more of it and you can't depreciate the land. So you'd like to put more into the building. So that's another, another thing to just kind of keep in mind. So if you, were to, if you were to look at your closing document, for example, for the purchase of our property uh, here, then this is very expensive property, but we're gonna say it costs 300,000. <laughs> I don't that It's actually selling for you know, multiple million dollars right now, but we're gonna say it's a $300,000 property. And uh, we would look through all the things that we had to expenditure on your closing document including the cost of the property, but all the other kind of stuff that you had, to, you had to make expenditures on, which were necessary in order to get the property, you know, complete and purchased and ready to be put in place for the rental. So you got to take into consideration all those other costs as basically the part of the cost of the property. And those are costs that you would like to be able to simply expense and not include them possibly at the cost of the property to get the expense now. But no, typically those are, should be included and packaged in to the cost of the property. Now, the next question is, well, how do I get the breakout between you know, the land and the building? So if I bought, if I bought the property for 300,000, how do I know how much is land and how much is building? Because that wasn't broken out in the sales agreement. They didn't tell me how much to allocate the land versus the building. I didn't buy them separately. So you might look at the property taxes, for example, and the property taxes calculation will typically allocate between land and building, although the last statement might not it won't match your purchase price. So the land in the building of the last statement might have been like 150,000 or let's say yeah, let's say 150,000 versus 20,000 which sums up to the 170,000 and then you could take the percent of that. So we're going to say this would was building building and this was land. So if I take the percentage of that and I could say okay, 150 divided by the 170 and then 20 divided by the 170 and I make those into percentages is about 88 and 12 and then I would underline that and if I sum that up we're talking about 88 and 12 that would sum up to 100 so if I took my 300,000 then so cost was 300,000 then I'd break out the land so land, land would be at 88% of it, 88% of the 300. This would be the 300 times the 88 and building, building, actually let's say building first, building and then land. Land would be at the 12% of it, making that a percent. So that would be the 300 times the 12%. So that's one way that you might go about kind of thinking about the breakout between the land and building, looking at the property taxes. And then if the, if the IRS questions you on the calculation, you can at least say, well, I'm just trying to follow the property taxes, right? So that's, you know, other than 
because they might question how much you, you applied to the land versus the building. Okay, let's put it on the books then. Let's put it on the books. We're going to go to the depreciation calculation page. And I'm just going to call it building. So I'm just going to say building. And I should probably be more specific. I would be in practice and add the address and everything. But I'm going to say building. And then the category is going to be, this is going to be for the building itself. And if we placed it in service, let's just say at the beginning of the year, 01, 01, let's say, let's say it was the middle of January, 01, 50, now let's say, let's say at the beginning, 01, 01, 01, uh, 21. So January 1st, 2021. And the cost of the building we said was this 264706 and then no section 179 then the method is going to be 27 and a half so this is the, the maker's method 27.5 years it's a straight line residential rental property and remember the, the government kind of forces us to use we can't just make up our own you know useful life we got to we got to go accordance to what category the property falls under and then prior depreciation, prior, prior special amortization. And then we have the land, which is not depreciable. So I'm going to say land. And that's going to be under the category of land. Land. Is that land? That's miscellaneous. Land. 010121. And the cost of it, we said, was the, what did we say? 35294. And the method there is land which is non-depreciable, non-depreciable, so land or no depreciation. So that's just gonna be stuck on the books kind of like an asset and, and we're just gonna record it. It's not gonna go down in value. Okay, let's check it out, go into the forms. And now we've got our, our rental property here and now we've got the depreciation pulling over of the 9,225. So obviously we didn't get the full amount of 300,000 deduction. We didn't get the building amount of 150,000 deduction. We had to put it on the books as an asset and then get the depreciation. Now we got the depreciation schedule, which is gonna be over here. We got 2021 and 2022. Let's take a look at the full thing, even though it's kind of small, it's a little small, but hopefully we can zoom in there and check it out. So we got the building, so this is the depreciable item, uh, 264706, 264706. Notice this stands for straight line uh, mid-month. That's what the double N stands for. And then a 27.5 life. So, so if I was to try, to try to mirror this, I'd say, okay, the building was a mid-month convention. So if I tried to recalculate this just to understand it, I'd say, okay, well, that would mean that for one year, it would be this divided by the life of 27.5. It's a straight line method. Let's add a decimal there. Let's underline it. So then you would think per year would be equal to this divided by that. And so there we have it. But then there's a mid-month convention. So there's months in a year, months, let's get it per month, months in a year. The months in a year are 12, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. So D pre per month would then be equal to this divided by 12 is that. And then, so I'm gonna underline that. I'm looking for the underline. So then we had, we had a half month convention. So we put it in there in January, but we only get half the month in January. So months, months in first year the months in the first year were going to be 11.5 because we have that half month convention. We make we make believe we bought it in the middle of the month. That's what the half month convention means in essence. Why did I center it? Shouldn't be centered. And so I want a decimal. That's what I want. So then we'll multiply that out 80 times that and this is first year depre depre so nine, so did I get that right? Nine, nine, two, two, five. So that's an idea. It's a straight line mid month convention, 27.5 year. Now, if you looked at year two, uh, 2022 for the regular depreciation, now you get the full year straight line. That would be at the 9,625. That's how much we're going to get next time, 9,625. So that's going to be the, the calculation for the. So once you get it on the books, it's pretty straightforward calculation. Notice the land is just sitting there. That's not doing anything. We're not depreciating the land. It's just on there to kind of complete 
the purchase process on our balance sheet accounts that should tie into you know our purchasing calculation and obviously when we put this purchasing calculation in we would add up the whole calculation here's the cost of it here's all the other stuff that we put into place to put the original amount on there and then there's our justification for the allocation between the building and the land for example now note that as we start expensing this thing you can see with the depreciation schedule then we can we can look at like the cost or basis after the depreciation uh, is taking place right so the so the the basis is going to be going down when you, you can think about this as like a the book value from from uh, an accounting kind of terminology so after that first year of depreciation for example we've got the the total cost let's say building and land total cost was 300,000 and then we depre so the ACC depre accumulated depreciation after year one would be this and then we're going to say that the adjusted basis in essence the adjusted cost would be the 290 that's important because we would rather have a higher basis too because when we sell the property it's going to be the sales price minus the basis so as we're eating up the accumulated depreciation we're digging into the basis which means that when we sell it we're more likely to have a gain at the point in time that we sell it now of course when you're talking about a gain with the real estate you got to think okay at that point in time could i convert it to, to personal property and possibly get an, an exemption on the gain is the gain going to be a capital gain versus the depreciation which might be a benefit on ordinary income might there be a difference between between those things and those kind of things add into the complexity of the discussion as well but let's talk about other depreciable kind of stuff that we might have then we could have like five-year property we could have seven-year property 15-year property other types of things that we need to put on the books as an asset so five-year property uh, could include things like computers and uh, equipment for example so let's let's say we had some five-year property we put on the books here and i'm going to put it on the books five-year property and let's say we just had uh, computers and uh, equipment let's just say computers 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 in our rental activity so then I'm gonna say this is going to be five this is going to be uh, equipment I called it right I called it machinery and equipment let's put it on the books let's say this one let's say it happened on 215 uh, 21 that we bought that and let's say it was for uh, 2400 I'll leave the section 179 as is and this is going to be five years and notice I have the five years I got the maker straight line but typically you're going to choose the five years equipment also note that you have special limitations for the auto that's why they have another five years for the auto because you might have caps for, with the regards to the auto for luxury automobile kind of caps and stuff but we'll keep it with the equipment now if I don't do anything else the system is going to try to calculate any 179 and special depreciation we might get so if I was to go back on over here and check this out I go back to my depreciation schedule and I'm going to say regular and so now you got your equipment down here 2400 notice that it took the whole thing in special depreciation so it's trying to it's trying to basically and those are accelerated depreciations that have been put in place and and those are the types of kind of things that you would expect the tax code to fluctuate in as to how much you might have in terms of uh advanced depreciation like 179 depreciation or special uh depreciation which are kind of like a topic in and of themselves but in that case it kind of acts as if you got to write off the whole thing in the first year so it kind of almost negates the idea of putting the thing on the books as a depreciable asset because it takes a little bit more time to put it on the books but you but you may get the full amount of the depreciation as it rolls in to the depreciation schedule in on the schedule e and note that they do that they do that special depreciation to kind of stimulate the economy so so again right now the economy is overheated so this is one thing that you would think from an economic standpoint they would start to taper back on but you know from a political standpoint that's not popular so you never know what's going to happen with like the special depreciation and the 179. if we were to try to take that layer off let's say they didn't qualify for the special depreciation and just look at the normal depreciation under makers so now i've removed the special depreciation and again of course if you if you could get the special depreciation you would typically 
I want to be able to get the special of the 179, but I removed it because this is back to like the normal rules, which you would think would be more consistent uh, over time. And so now you've got the 200 DB, which is double uh, declining balance, what I would call it. Um, and then the, the half year, that stands for a half year convention, five year life, and then the 200, that's the rate that we're gonna use on like a table kind of method. So if I was to reconstruct that, it's a little bit more confusing. If I was to, if I was to say, okay, we put this on the books, this is equipment had a cost of the what did I say I said I said that had a cost of the 2400 so then we're going to say that the useful life so the life was five years and so if I underline that I'm going to say then this is going to be equal to this divided by five which gives me a rate if I was to look at the rate would be this divided by this, making that a percent, that would be our 20%. You can also think of it just as one divided by five would be the 20%. That's our straight line rate if it was a double declining balance. Now, if I was to double it for double declining, then the double declining rate would be the 40%. So this is where it gets a little bit tricky because you could see they multiplied it by 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 the straight line rate which is the 20 percent that's because of the half year convention so in other words i would normally take year one year one depreciation year one depree depree would be equal to the 2400 times the 40 percent but it's not that because there's a half year convention half year convention which means we assume we bought it in the middle of the year so we divide it by two so I'm gonna take, take that divided by two, and that's year one. That's year one depreciation. So, so basically you could just do the straight line because of the half year convention, which again is kind of confusing. If I was to take that to year two, using a normal double declining balance, I now have the original amount of the 2,400 minus the amount that we depreciated last year. That's gonna give us then the 1,000, uh, uh, 920 and then I would multiply that not times the 20% but times the 40% because that's the double declining rate and so in year two you would think it would be 768 if it was a normal double declining with the mid-year if I go to year two here 2022 you could see that we have uh, the 768 in year two so just to get an idea Obviously, you can see that we're depreciating more in the current year than in the following year. That's normal kind of double declining. Well, we would be depreciating more, except we had that half year convention. So we bought it in February. We assumed we bought it in uh, in the middle of the year, 615, right? And that's why it basically breaks down to that straight line, which confuses people because it's not really straight line, even though it looks that way in the first year of the purchase. Okay, so you could have seven year property, for example. So we might have seven year property, which includes stuff like office furniture. And you wanna be specific when you put this on the books. Notice I just said computers here. You wanna you want to actually list out the actual computer. So Dell computer, here's the number on it. Because if you bought like five of them, you probably wanna put each of the computers on the books separately. Because if you sell one of the computers or one of them breaks, you gotta take that thing off the books. And when you take it off the books, if you can't find it on the depreciation schedule or you grouped a 10 computers into one line item, then it causes problems when you sell the, the asset or, or uh, it, it's disposed of in some way. So now let's say, but I'm doing generic stuff here. So I'm gonna say furnit <clears throat> furniture. So again, you'd wanna list out, this is the sofa, the brown one with the tag on it or something like that. So that you could find it in case you sold it or something like that. At a future point you can find it on the depreciation schedule but uh we're being generic here we're being generic okay so activity and this is going to be the category of furniture and this let's say this happened on 03 15 21 and it costs uh 1900 i don't know and then the rate on that one is this one's going to be seven year property we're going to say it's seven year and again we would probably choose the the double declining not the straight line because we would get more up front if i don't do anything to it it'll probably try to take the 
these these special depreciation again so you get the special depreciation if i was to eliminate that just so you can see the calculation of the double declining i could say we don't qualify for special we'll not take the 179 and we'll just take a look at it here and then you could see the double declining uh, calculation here for year uh, 2021 and then the second year calculated here so i won't do the calculation again because it's it's similar and then we could have 15 year property uh, for like roads and uh, fences i won't put that in at this point now you also might have improvements that you put on the property right if you had improvements on the property like you expanded on the property you, your first thought is like well can i put it into repairs maybe because then you get to expense it if it's bringing it back to like its normal operating condition maybe in repairs but if not then you might have to put it into improvements and when you're doing the bookkeeping for this type of stuff you're kind of looking at that at that kind of thing if you see a lot of stuff in supplies you're like oh there's a hundred thousand in supplies that seems like maybe we should be capitalizing something there or repairs has a large dollar amount in it that might make you dig into it and see if there's anything that should be capitalized because if you don't do that then that could be kind of like a red flag you would think for the irs as well if there's this large amount that's going to be expensed if you do expense a large amount because you believe it should be categorized as repairs instead of as improvements for example you want to make sure you log that down as to your rationale in the event that there's an issue with it so if we if we had like other improvements that we had to put on the books then we might put that on as another line item improvements and again you'd want to you know list out the the thing that was the improvement that was put into place and i'm being generic category is going to be the improvements and let's say this happened on let's say oh uh 70221 and let's say it was for 60,000 improvement of some kind and then or let's make the improvement in 2022 just so we could see it so that happened in the following year we, we put it in place and then we added an improvement in the next year and the method it's going to generally have to be aligning with the method of the property itself which was that 27.5 year straight line residential real estate and so so that's a long time to have to write off that improvement over so so what you'd like to be able to do is categorize the improvement first as a, as a repairs or something if you could and if you can't then maybe be able to categorize it as some other depreciable asset if possible that has a shorter life uh to it and then if not then you got to categorize it over that long life which is going to be not as beneficial typically so if i look at the depreciation schedule now we've got the building and the land and then if i go to 2022 not in the current year now we've got the category of the improvements as well now also note that if you purchase a lot of stuff like at the end of the time period it would convert from a mid a mid month convention for i'm sorry a, a mid-year convention for things like like the uh, furniture and so on to a mid uh to a mid-quarter convention so let's say we made a substantial purchase of like five-year property for example and it was i'm going to call it i'm going to call it uh equipment and again that's very generic and not good you'd want to be more specific so that you know what kind of equipment you're purchasing but let's say we bought equipment for on and let's say that happened on 12 uh 12 20 21 and let's say it was a significant amount like 70,000 of equipment and so that's going to be most of the equipment and so i'm going to say that was five years so now if i if i move back on over because i believe it's more than 40 percent was purchased in you know the fourth quarter now they're going to say we're not going to allow you that mid-month uh convention in the same manner possibly let's take off the special depreciation so did the special depreciation i'm going to take that off just to look at this mid-quarter thing a little bit more closely so if i go back on over so now it's got notice it switched this to 200 double uh double declining balance i would call it mid-quarter instead of the mid-month convention the i'm sorry instead of the mid-year convention and then you've got the rate that's being applied to it and notice it also did it to the computers before i put that in place the computer was at a a mid 
year convention <laughs> instead of a mid-quarter convention. So just to see that, so that, that basically means in the first year, instead of assuming it was purchased in the middle of the year, we assume it was purchased in the middle of the quarter. Now, note, I can, I can see, you could see this change if I made that dollar amount on this one, something small, smaller at least, like, like let's say it was 2000 and I go back on over. Now it doesn't, it doesn't do that. So now we're on the half year convention again. So if you see that switch over and you say, hey, I thought there was a half year convention on like machinery and equipment and so on, then, but if you made a large purchase in the last quarter, then it's gonna, it's gonna kick it over and it's gonna kick everything over to the mid quarter convention, the, the rationale being that it looks like you might be taking advantage of the, of the mid month convention. And, and some of the stuff might not be, you know, as relevant when there's like a 179 and special depreciation in place. But again, those things could, could fall away at some point, you might not always qualify for it. So it's good to have an idea of the, you know, convention methods, because those will probably stick around, even as the accelerated depreciations with the 179, and the special uh, fall in and out of favor as changes in the economy happen and, and the, you know, whatever happens with the law happens with the law. So we'll see and we'll follow it and it'll be interesting.